Hello, and welcome to our lecture today on cults and gurus, both terms that we'll be quite familiar with by the end of this lecture. So generally, we hear this word cult all the time. Uh, it comes from a Latin word, cultus, which means worship or the offering of worship or a worshipful offering in general, a thing to be worshiped. So from the Oxford English Dictionary, we see the etymology of cult comes from uh, the classical Latin cultus, which means to which means worship, the act of worship, or our religious observance. So when we talk about a cult, generally we're talking about a religious group. Some people will paraphrase the word cult and say a cult is a small religious group, and all uh, religious groups started small. So the so a cult is the root of all religions. That may be true, but the real word just comes like a cult is something that offers worship or some worship that one offers. So uh, we can also note that the word cult uh, is in our word culture. So worshipfulness, religious observances is kind of the root of anything. But what do we mean in English when we say something is a cult? And is this the proper meaning? I mean, it's a pejorative meaning. When I say that's a cult, we all kind of know what I mean. I mean, it's like a it's like a bad religious group. Well, a cult is a new religious movement. So that's the term we use in religious studies for, uh, I mean, what, what we are calling cults. Uh, this is a technical term in religious studies, uh, and it generally refers to basically just religious stuff that's new, that's relatively recent, or an alternative spirituality. So the term cult or a new religious movement when, when we're talking about, we're talking about a, a religious group that is more recent than established religions like Christianity or Buddhism. Though usually we see that these new religious movements come out of an established religion. Usually what happens is a charismatic leader uh, comes along with a novel interpretation of a more traditional religion, such as Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism, and then adds new scriptures and ritual systems and ritual systems to build out a new religious movement, to create a new religious culture. The vast majority of new religious movements in the United States are Protestant Christian based. One of the classic new religious movements that we can look at in the last couple of centuries is Mormonism. So Joseph Smith created a new interpretation of Christianity based on some golden tablets that he found. Now, intriguingly, uh, it makes sense that he would find these golden tablets because he was from a long tradition of dowsers and so folks who can uh, divine whether there's water under the ground and treasure finders. That was common that there were these characters that could go out and find treasures sort of psychically or, or magically. So it kind of makes sense that he would have found these golden tablets. So out of the movement that grew up around him, they ended up fleeing to Utah because they started out in the east of the United States. And out there, they built a full ritual system, new types of church temples, scriptures, and a whole societal infrastructure. They created a culture, the Mormon culture. The term new religious movement is not to denigrate such religions or call them invalid, which is what the term cult does. Cult generally means this is lame, it's invalid, it's dangerous. So when we say new religious movement, we're not being pejorative. So these aren't bad groups, they're just new groups. And uh, as one of my teachers used, used to always say, citing a uh, Werner Herzog movie, uh, even giants started out small. Everything has to start somewhere. So the early Catholic church would refer to the cult of Mary to describe devotion to Mary. So it's not, a pejorative term. You have the cult referring to different fandoms, like the cult of Marvel or the cult of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We hear people say this. Then you hear the phrase, the cult of personality or the cult of celebrity and the way folks almost worship charismatic figures in politics and celebrity worlds and whatnot. So when I say charisma, what do I mean? Charisma is more than just having a captivating personality. Charisma is more than just being a celebrity. Like we look at a celebrity, you look at a Matthew McConaughey and you hear him say, all right, all right, all right. And you look at him and you hear that and you, you get this, there's something so charismatic. It's captivating. Well, when I'm saying charisma in the sense of religion, I mean something a little bit more. To that, we're going to turn to Max Weber, who you have pictured here, who is always important to read when we're thinking about religious studies. Weber says, 
Charisma is a certain quality of an individual's personality uh, by virtue of which he is set apart from ordinary men and treated as endowed with supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. The charismatic figure becomes more than human. Sometimes they are considered to be the divine on earth. Um, but what we do see is that regardless of how they're considered, if they're considered divine or not, these charismatic qualities give them a strong sense of religious authority. Now, I'm talking about cults. I have a picture here from the children of God, and you can go ahead and look into them at some point. They're one of the more uh, upsetting cults in the 20th century. So when I'm talking about cults, I'm really pushing at and describing an the antisocial qualities of some religious groups. The vast majority of new religious movements are not harmful or violent in any way, though there are some instances of this and examples abound. We'll talk about a few of them as we go along. I define a cult as a new religious movement characterized by high control, by a charismatic leader, and by antisocial utopianism. Let me unpack that. By high control, I mean that the group attempts to overly schedule and dominate the followers' time. Furthermore, so they try to fill, you know, you're, you're always working, likely not being paid, but you're always programmed. You're always doing something for the religious group. You're always, you know, serving the organization or performing services or recruiting new members. You just, you're constantly busy if you are involved in one of these groups. Furthermore, they attempt to reprogram your brain so that only uh, the, so that the only brain software you have is the teachings of the group. They sort of rework your brain tech. Um, and even some groups use this Scientology term, tech or technology for their psychological tools. The thing is they get the ideology of the group so established in your brain that you constantly, like your brain defaults to how they see the world. Now this happens in all religions and that you sort of change your brain in order to accept the truth as the religion stands hands down to you. When I was raised as a Calvinist, I would often say that it's not up to a human being to understand God. The goal is to understand yourself and change yourself so you can accept God, so you can accept the truth of any religion. All right, so uh, a charismatic leader is a founder and may have many successors. They are considered to be more than human, touched by God to speak as God or to be divine in some way. Remember that definition that I had right back there from Weber. They have some quality of their personality that sets them apart and endows them with supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. So you're, you have a charismatic leader. Finally, they are anti-societal or they have an anti-social utopianism. Utopia means a place from nowhere. So utopia, utopos, a place from nowhere, a place that does not exist. So when we say utopian, we mean that there's like a, a, an attempt to create an idealized society. This idealized society, however, is remarkably antisocial. They try to set up a new society in their group that seeks to critique or even reject the dominant values of the community. As such, they try to isolate and remove people from their family and normal surroundings. You go from having an extended network of friends and family members and whatnot to your family becomes the religious group. And in time, the religious group will seek to isolate you from contact with those outside the religious groups. So one thing I want you to remember is Folks do not join a new religious movement with a desire to join a cult per se. Um, they are joining a good group and they seek to improve themselves and their world. But unfortunately, the nature of the charismatic guru often leads to leaders and the, found, and the founders and the inner circle at the highest level of the group really enriching themselves rather than enriching their followers. There was a person who left the, the cult Nexium, and he said, I remember watching a documentary and he said, you don't join a cult, you join a good thing because you want to do good in the world. So how do you spot a cult? And here's a number of cult leaders all over the place in the back from David Koresh to Charles Manson to Jim Jones, uh, you know, the big ones, the big guys. Uh, okay, so how do you spot a cult? Well, cults are negative groups that are high control organizations. They try to control your money, your food, your sleep, and your time. So if you're seeing a group in which people become sort of um, 
they that they have these like incredible ridiculous schedules and they don't sleep a lot and everything is sort of structured by the group that's one thing to put it if you join the average church down the block they might ask you for 10 percent of your money but they're not going to insist that you you know eat a low protein diet and subsist on 500 calories a day and that you uh, get up very early in the morning and work all day long for that church okay so negative groups also have charismatic leaders that promote that high control. If you have a religious leader who's promoting having complete control over you and you turning over all of your agency and your time and your whole life to them, that's a good indication that you're dealing with a cult. They tend to be very secretive in their structures. So you might know the founder, but you don't know who's actually running the show. You don't know about like the other groups uh, and the, the rankings of people in the organization and how they kind of work. It might appear when you look at them that it's just like the guru or the leader and the disciples. But when you start trying to figure out who's who, who does the other stuff, who organizes the day to day and it gets really secretive and you don't know who has power over others, that's another indi indication. Uh, these negative groups try to extract money, but also work towards financial, de financial dependence upon the group. So um, what they'll try to do is they'll try to, one, get you to give as much money as they can, but then they'll also want you to work for the group and they'll like pay you very little money so you're financially dependent on them, or they'll set you up where you live in the, the organization's sort of housing, but you get this sense that um, where would you go otherwise? They want you to become financially uh, dependent. Also on extracting wealth, you'll if you start to notice in any group that wealthy people and influential people gain privilege uh, very quickly, as opposed to normal folks who don't get a lot of privilege or move up in the ranks very quickly, that's also a sign. Wealth ensures a high status in a lot of these communities. So if you bring money to the table, you're going to have much more presence in the cult. Uh, what is not a sign of a cult? Innovative teachings. Just because somebody has an in innovative teaching or understanding of religion, that is by no means the sign of somebody running a cult. You have to look at some of these more greater sociological uh, features. So um, I would like to talk about a few religious figures today, but and I'm going to talk about them from a context of Hinduism for the most part. I want to be clear that most Hindus do not belong to such groups. And many groups, such as the ones that you describe here, Indians and Hindus have no problem calling a cult. So the religion of sort of god men in India range from quite small positive local groups to some other transnational uh, religions of highly controlling godmen. But you'll notice that the sort of cult groups with the highly controlling godmen tend to have a, a wider viewpoint. They tend to have more Westerners involved, in fact. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we can remember in the Indian context, you know, we have gurus all over the place. On the right, I have a picture of the first and the 10th Sikh gurus. So um, their very God is guru and they had 10 gurus. And the last guru said that the spirit of the guru would be found present in their holy scripture. In the center, we have great Drona. Remember Drona, the Brahmin teacher of weaponry uh, and teacher of about everything in the Mahabharata, he would be considered a guru as would be Bhishma, the great Bhishma. I mean, there are a lot of groups with gurus that do not exhibit high control. And if you don't see the high control aspect, you're not dealing with a group. You're dealing with just a new religious movement or just a group of God men in general. Okay, so the behaviors that we'll see to really create a cult per se almost requires someone to be a Westerner. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Now, the term guru is thought to have a lot of meanings. My favorite was one that a goofy dude that I know who's now in prison said to me one time, I don't need a guru because look, C, or no, G, U, R, U. G, U, R, U. G, U, R, U. The guru shows you G, U, R, U, which I always thought was ridiculous. Um, there are other sort of folk etymologies, such as a guru is one who dispels the darkness. Dispel, ru, or remove almost kind of, and gu means darkness or secret. The guru is the one who dispels the darkness. That's also kind of kind of sort of folk etymologies that are kind of silly. The term guru just means heavy, as in one who is heavy from the weight of his good qualities. A guru in general can be a spiritual teacher, 
to whom one submits. That's really what's going on with a guru. A guru is a teacher who you give your submission to. You say, I will submit myself to you and you will teach me or you will make me the best I can be. So um, a traditional guru, guru really sees himself or herself as a teacher and a protector of their devotees and someone who's trying to make the world a better place. Again, remember Bhishma and Drona, they were great gurus who taught religion and warfare to the Kauravas and the Pandavas. So um, a lot of traditional gurus are just that, they're just teachers. So you can, have a, you can have a dance guru, you can have multiple gurus. You can have a spiritual guru and also your guru of accounting or chemistry, you know, you can, you can have a guru of anything, but people will often say that the thing with a guru is once you accept them, you have to do what they say, no matter what, which is not something that we particularly enjoy uh, to have that sort of attitude about our teachers in the United States. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you about a specific guru that we read about in Andrea Jane's piece and Liz Harris's piece. Um, you may notice that the readings this week were actually on the lighter side. Uh, I, I assigned a couple of magazine articles. I wanted to just, you know, I, I from this aspect, we could do sort of like a heavy religious studies study of gurus, but I think it's more interesting to kind of look at more popular writings sometimes, and also to, um, to use sort of case studies. So here I'm going to talk about Swami Muktananda. Muktananda means something like, or Muktananda means he who enjoys the bliss of liberation. And we're going to be talking in the context of a group called Siddha Yoga. Here are their three historical gurus here. You have on the left, you have Nityananda, he who is always uh, in bliss. Then you have Muktananda in the center and all the way to the right, you have Swami Chitvalasananda, who's also known as Guru Mai, and she's the contemporary guru in Siddha Yoga. We'll talk about all of them. So uh, Andrea Jain argues that Muktananda was a very modern guru who crafted his organization and ideology that he called Siddha Yoga for a transnational and Western leaning audience. He was appealing to more than just his little group in the West of India. He, as he framed his ideology and his spiritual organization, he framed it to appeal to Westerners and to go beyond, uh, to go pan-Indian. And he even said what he wanted to do was create a worldwide meditation revolution. He taught a form of modern Tantra yoga that was conceived as a meditation revolution that would sweep the world. At the same time, he was a traditional guru in the sense that he had you know, Indian followers at the beginning. Uh, he was also a sadhu, so he was a renunciate. And he was also secretly a tantrika who performed sexual practices. Uh, this is denied by Siddha Yoga to this day. Um, and another interesting problem with Siddha Yoga is uh, his two successors, who ended up being only one successor, had a hard time maintaining the level of charisma that Muktananda had. Um, I know I've, I need to tell you, I've spent a fair amount of time with these organizations. I know a lot of members. And even at a certain point in my life, I was an insider to this group. I've spent a lot of time at their ashram in India, even though I've never sort of like fully enrolled in any programming there. I, it always really appealed to me. So it's interesting to look back on this as sort of a case study. And I'll tell you, this is a story that's not going to end in incredible financial fraud. And it's not a story that's going to end up in... Um, and I, well, I mean, there's a sex scandal, but there's always a sex scandal. Just take it from me. There is always a sex scandal in a religious movement. Um, and there's not going to be, you know, murders or killings or anything. It's Nobody's going to go to jail in this story. Okay, so what is Siddha Yoga? Well, Siddha Yoga is kind of based around this idea of Shaktipat. The guru can do Shaktipat. Shaktipat means the descent of grace, the descent of Shakti. Shakti means grace, but it also means that feminine divine power. So what happens is the guru awakens Shakti in you or puts Shakti in you. And then through the guru's grace, that Shakti will steadily unfold in the devotee over time and eventually confer liberation. This uh, organization is thought to be able to give you liberation dur during life, though nobody ever gets that. But it's thought that once you die, everything will perfectly unfold and you'll become liberated at death. Now, how does Shaktipat happen? Well, it can be given by a touch, by the guru giving you a flower or some prasad, by the guru just looking at you, 
or by giving you a mantra. Swami Muktananda, Muktananda, in fact, would uh, always have like a like a a wada or like a big kind of staff of peacock feathers that he would bonk people on the heads on to confer Shakti Pot. Now I was in India one time, and one Swami in the order, because uh, Muktananda initiated people to become renunciates into his order of Siddha Yoga. One Swami who'd been doing practice for many, 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 many years and living with the different gurus said that um, he did not even do spiritual practice anymore because his kundalini, remember we've talked about kundalini, I'll talk about this more, would awaken as he slept according to the plan and grace of the guru. So he didn't even need to meditate. Now this Shakti Pat is thought to awaken the kundalini. Remember the coiled one, the serpent that rises along the spine. And as the kundalini awakens, it's thought to bring about a realization of non-duality, that all is consciousness experiencing itself, that everything is God. Um, the bodily components found in Hatha Yoga and Tantra, such as the manipulations of the bodily fluids, are not found here, though, as we see, Muktananda said that it was only through his celibacy, through his transmutation of, of, of his semen, that he was able to give Shakti Pat in the first place. So it's still all in there. It's just people don't talk about it. It's been, it's been kind of, Siddha Yoga shifts things around, so a lot of the confusing, more Indic elements or make way for just having a profound meditative realization that everything is one. Shakti Pat has sort of other elements of the guru entering and changing the disciple. The guru is thought to enter into you and awaken that. And of course, what is unsaid is there's a very profound sort of sexual imagery right here. So the guru is a representative of God and can also act as God on earth, transmitting this catalyst for liberation. However, <clears throat> we have to be careful here. This is a non-dual system. All is one. The guru is God, but so are you. Your essential self is God. So is the world. The world is God who has fallen asleep in order to have the joy of finding himself again. One of the constant things that they talk about in Siddha Yoga is in meditation, you'll experience this blue pearl of consciousness, this blue pearl of consciousness deep in your heart. And that by learning to work with that blue pearl of consciousness, you'll realize that it is essentially God and that everything around the universe is just the play of God and the play of consciousness. In time, one comes to see oneself and all of the world as just the workings of Shiva. Okay, so let's hear about Muktananda's life a little bit. He was born into a wealthy South Indian family in Karnataka near Mangalore. Um, but as a young boy, he met his guru. His guru, Nityananda, came walking by and saw him. And Muktananda had a profound realization, realized he wanted to be a Swami when he met this guru when he was a young boy. Um, Nityananda himself, who you see pictured here, had no guru of his own. He was an avaduta who was thought to be born enlightened. So he was enlightened throughout his life. And I've spent a fair amount of time meditating Nityananda's Samadhi shrine in Ganeshpuri, a town I'll talk about in a second. And there's really something to it. Um, I, I really like Nityananda. There was very little, he wrote very little down. Um, they call, they've collected his sayings into one small scripture that has been translated in English because it's really hard to get a hold of. And I remember one time I was in India and I met a whole bunch of people who'd live, who were a family of people who'd always been devoted to Nityananda, who had no interest in Muktananda or uh, Chidvelasananda, who comes next. Uh, and they were just, they were really delightful people. And Nityananda really much functions like, uh, like we've talked about, like a local saint in that place, even though he's been gone for many, many years. So Muktananda ends up uh, leaving his family at, in the middle of the night, as is common, to renounce. He joins a sadhu order. In fact, it's a subgroup of the Dasnami order. The Dasnami are an order of Shaiva renunciates. And he takes initiation under one Shiva Siddharudha Swami. That guy initiated him and gave him his name, but then Muktananda just took off. Uh, he wore the gold, the ochre clo clothes of a Dasnami, 
Um, but, you know, he wasn't really associated with any other gurus. For 10 years, he wandered and studied with many gurus and traveled throughout India going on his pilgrimages. This was his formal renunciation. Now, we need to note here that he did not maintain a, a regular affiliation with any sort of sadhu order. And his philosophy was not very tantra-like, well, during this time period. His early focus was on Advaita Vedanta, but later he embraced a style of tantra called Kashmir Shaivism, or better yet, the Trika Kaula. We don't need to get into that too much. So he drew upon tantra scriptures sort of as he progressed, Muktananda did, um, but he used them really selectively and the group is really hazy about their Tantra affiliation. I remember a friend of mine saying to another teacher, uh, or to a, to a religious studies scholar, asking him about the roots of Siddha Yoga. And he was like, oh, they're Tantricas, all of them. That's Tantra there. It's a very cleaned up and anesthetized or deodorized Tantra. But what we are going to see here is Tantra nonetheless. So um, as he got older, uh, at the age of 39, Muktananda met Nityananda again. And when he saw Nityananda, he was like, this is it. This is my guy. So he saw Nityananda to be God himself. So Muktananda settles down by Nityananda in a little town called Ganeshpuri, which is just north of Bombay. And this was a jungle town that hadn't been much of a place, but so many devotees came because they loved Nityananda that they built up this little temp this temple town. As you can see, it's pretty well established now. Um, at some point, Nityananda supposedly transmitted the very power of his lineage to Muktananda by sticking his hand down his throat. This event is disputed, and many Nityananda people say that Nityananda never said that uh, Muktananda was his successor in any way. The other kind of weird thing is that Nitya, if for Nityananda to submit a power of his lineage, well, he doesn't have a lineage. He doesn't have a guru. He was born enlightened. So what would the lineage have been? I would argue it is the lineage of these disembodied figures called Siddhas that are thought to be liberated entities that are around us all the time, but they're disembodied. So um, Muktananda receives a wide range of Indian and Western dev devotees, including a few devotees who become Western gurus in and of themselves. Now, if you go to Ganeshpuri, and I love Ganeshpuri, the town where Siddha Yoga is really found, you'll find that people have varied degrees of love for Muktananda. And the so a lot of people there are Nityananda devotees, many are Muktananda devotees. I found that the folks that just live in Ganeshpuri, not as many of them are into the contemporary guru or the contemporary version of Siddha Yoga. Many folks who are villagers in uh, Ganeshpuri argue that they that their town, which you'll see from the right on the right, is like the old area of town, and then on the left, that's a picture of the Siddha Yoga ashram. Many sort of villagers argue that their little town has got transformed into a cosmopolitan retreat site, and they would rather just stay in an Indian jungle village. I don't blame them. In one hotel where I often stay, and this is a picture of it right here, they actually have a secret room. Um, that is not for the public and is definitely not for Westerners. And I've never been able to get in there. And they, and they always tell me that they're, they're, this room doesn't exist. In this room, they have a large statue of Nityananda and they regularly do puja worships to that statue. Uh, I've seen, they left the door open one time and I saw it and they refused to answer any questions, <laughs> which is fine. Um, a lot of the people in the town are long-term Nityananda or Muktananda devotees. I don't encounter many people there that are into the contemporary yoga guru, Siddha Yoga Guru, but who goes by the name of Guru Mai. They've expressed a lot of frustration to me uh, at the results from the charity projects because Siddha Yoga is always saying, oh, we'll set up a free hospital. And then it never happens. Or, oh, we've got a mobile eye clinic, but it's it, it never really works. So a lot of the proposed charity that Siddha Yoga has said they'll do for the community just hasn't panned out because that's not really their thing. Siddha Yoga is into growing themselves, not really doing charity work. And this is odd because Nityananda actually started his own hospital there that you know wasn't kept up by any of the further successors. And usually these gurus, uh, a traditional guru is quite engaged in charity. 
So this ashram resembles a Western retreat center uh, more than a regular gurukul or guru school or an ashram. Remember, ashram means a place of no work, a place of no toil, or depending on how you render the term, people often say that place of no work, but if it's ashram, this was ashram, ashram means a place of religious exertion. I would argue Muktananda knew what he was doing when he framed his organization, Siddha Yoga, in the way that he did. Siddha Yoga sort of switched from an Indian movement that was very much located uh, around this one regional area to becoming a pan-Western movement. It was very oriented toward the American context. Here we see uh, Guru Mai on the left and Muktananda on the right. Muktananda died in 84. Uh, Guru Mai, or Swami Chidvalasananda, is still the head of Siddha Yoga, though she rarely uh, appears in public these days. Okay, so Siddha Yoga. Well, what's this word siddha in the first place? Well, a siddha traditionally is a perfected human being. And the gurus of this group are considered siddhas. They are considered to be perfect uh, devotees or perfectly uh, evolved creatures. I remember one woman said to me one time that, that Guru Mai did not need to do religious practices because she was already enlightened. She was only doing religious practices for us, her devotees. I'm... I don't know. So anyway, so a siddha is a perfected human being. And like I said, the gurus are considered siddhas, but, and this is kind of a lesser point that they don't make in their literature a lot, but I've heard it from a bunch of devotees. A siddha is also considered to be a disembodied being, someone who was once human and became liberated and perfected. So siddha yoga is the yoga that makes people into siddhas, but it is also the yoga that is supported by the siddhas, these uh, already liberated creatures that are invisible but around us and can affect us at all times. So originally Siddha Yoga appealed to urban Indians and Westerners who could easily access the Guru's teaching. So who could get access to the Guru's teaching? Well, if you would go there, you pay to stay there and you can pay to go on like a two day, what they call an intensive uh, or one day intensive. And in that intensive, they'll have a powerful religious experience. So Muktananda invented these intensive programs. So you would go to the ashram, uh, you'd start very early in the morning, you'd like chant and meditate all day. And there's all, it's all structured and there are talks and whatnot. And then the guru comes around and bonks people on the head or gazes at them or sings and stares at people. And that's thought to confer the Shakti pot. Now, the intensives were and are filled with spontaneous kriyas. What do I mean by kriyas? A kriya is a physical manifestation of devotion and the effects of shaktipat. So kriya means like they'd say the shaktipat works if somebody starts shaking or they, they, just, or they start singing or they have a, a, a new insight. If there's some change in the person, they say that the shaktipat has happened. Today, uh, Siddha Yoga gurus will even, or the Siddha Yoga Guru, Guru Mai, has intensives on the internet. And it is said that she can confer Shaktipat even through the electrons of the internet. Um, these intensives are available to everybody. It doesn't matter your caste. It doesn't matter your religious background. In this sense, these gurus really are doing the work of removing caste distinctions in that these gurus and godmen in general appeal to all people. They, they tend to not be as sectarian. Um, the thing is, all of this is available to you if you have the money. Now, Westerners always bristle at that, uh, but Indians don't have, and Hindus don't have this hang up about paying for a religious experience. Protestant Christians are really hung up on paying for religious experiences. Why? My guess would be because Protestant Christian church is always kind of free. There you go. Uh, but yeah, so even traditionally, if a guru is to kind of take you under his discipleship, you have to pay a guru dakshina. So a small fee, or it could be quite a large fee, in order that that guru will take you on as a disciple. So in general, um, and this is an argument made uh, in a number of, of texts, these popular gurus give you a way to be religious if you are far removed from your family, from your village, from the traditional contacts. So if you've moved to the city and you're away from your family and you're away from your family temple and your family deities and whatnot, one thing you can do is, well, you can start praying at a local temple or you can start following around a guru who will 
you know, be able to give you an engaged way of being a religious, but away from your traditional family context. In this sense, these gurus sort of re-enchant the world. Now, Muktananda toured and lived in the United States in three periods. In 1970, he lived in the U.S. Uh, he also lived there from 74 to 76, and also from 78 to 81. Eventually, he set up shop in New Fallsburg in upstate New York, where his ashram there, albeit in a somewhat diminished form, exists today. They took over three old dilapidated hotels and built an extensive ashram there that is still there, hard to get access to, but it's still there. Muktananda had some sex scandals, but like I said, every group has a sex scandal. Um, he had a couple of sexual practices that he did that you know a lot of people are upset about, understandably. He performed sexual practices with a number of women and young girls at the end of his life. He was never really accused of raping anybody, but some of the girls were a little on the young side. On the other hand, Coming from the traditional Indic background of South India, these women wouldn't be considered, we don't, they don't have a notion of the age of, the cons, of consent in the same way that we have. Like you're an adult when you're 18. As a traditional Hindu, you're generally considered, you know, a proper adult the minute you hit puberty. Okay, so what he would do, and we'll go through the details of, of what folks reported he would do, because we've talked a fair amount about tantric sex in this class. He would enter women, he would put his penis inside of them and remain there, always unerect for a very long time, and he never ejaculated. Theoretically, what was he doing? Well, he was pulling shakti or feminine power from women and drawing it into himself, perhaps to keep himself alive because he was in pretty ill health. Living for 10 years basically as an itinerant sadhu, which is even rougher than living as a homeless person, took his toll, took a great toll on his health, which was reflected later in his life. In fact, one devotee told this kind of strange story to sort of justify um, the guru's behavior. So he tells this story about another guru, unnamed, who's critiqued for surrounding himself by women. And having all these women around, people are like, what are you doing? He said, bring me a bucket. And he brings his bucket, they bring him a bucket, he ejaculates and fills the bucket. Then he reabsorbs using the Vajroli mudra, the fountain pen technique, uh, to reabsorb all of that semen back into himself. The point of this is that sexual activity can still be uh, considered, so you can have sort of sexual activities, but as long as you don't properly ejaculate from the sexual activity, it can still be continent, it can still be celibate. So um, there are further practices in which a man will ejaculate in tantric sex and pull his uh, semen back inside of his penis, also pulling in the vaginal blood and vaginal secretions. And these are thought to be that transformative nectar in tantra. Why this story? The story is you shouldn't judge a guru or a siddha. Um, that's what the de devotee said about this story. Like, you don't, you don't know how he can be acting in a way that you wouldn't expect, but he's still being pious. I would argue that this is a story <clears throat> that gives a tacit endorsement of Tantra and yoga sexual practices. The folks who knew about these scandalous acts uh, insulated the guru from having to answer these questions. They just made sure nobody would ask him directly about it. And while Siddha Yoga has always said that it does not endorse these tantric sexual practices, um, Muktananda was doing them. Uh, and because of that, after Muktananda died and these uh, sort of sexual practices were revealed, there were a lot of people that started doing more sexually and based, uh, sexually oriented practices within Siddha Yoga, which Siddha Yoga had never endorsed before. In fact, when you're staying at any Siddha Yoga ashram, and this has always been the case, you're supposed to remain, even if you're there with your wife or partner, you're supposed to remain uh, celibate. Now, there are problems when a guru dies. So we read Oh Guru Guru by Liz Harris. Uh, she wrote a piece in the New Yorker called Oh Guru Guru Guru, which we read, describing the problems for Siddha Yoga in the modern age. Eventually, the sex scandals that did happen were made public. This led to doubts about Muktananda's message, but it also led to a sort of sex craze in the community when folks started experimenting with sex and they had no background about how to do these sort of tantric practices because they're not found in the Siddha Yoga literature. 
a wide range of insiders. So people who are high up devotees in the organization would continually deny the sex these sexual activities of their founder. And they would try to rebrand Siddha Yoga after Muktananda had died as as uh, they would try to reframe Siddha Yoga by denying that any of these sexual activities happened. In fact, a number of prominent professors whom I will not name put together a book in the 90s called Meditation Revelation, uh, Revolution in which they were supposedly writing, you know, like a set of articles and essays about Siddha Yoga that was a religious studies book. But in fact, when they, when you really look at it, and I read it, it doesn't read like a religious studies book. It reads like they're making up scripture or making up uh, doctrine and literature that is pro Siddha Yoga using their academic qualifications. And in this, there's uh, a history of Siddha Yoga that does not talk about anything I'm gonna talk about now uh, and completely denies and doesn't even mention anything about the sexual yoga practices that Muktananda had done. One prominent professor who did write an article in there and was not an insider to Siddha Yoga, when the book came out and he looked at the final product, he said, wait, I didn't agree to be a part of this. You said you were gonna write a critical history of Siddha Yoga. Now you've got like this fluffy book that says everybody should be into Siddha Yoga and you've got my essay in there. So you're basically hijacking my name and reputation as well. He was right to be angry. Anyway, okay. So Muktananda right before his death had declared a brother and sister to be co-heads of the order. Neither of them had the same level of accomplishment or charisma than Muktananda. At initiation, the boy who was younger was named Nityananda, like he, Muktananda gave, the, gave him the name of his own guru. So like Nityananda, Nityananda, um, Nity, Nityananda Jr. And the sister was named Gurumai Chidvalasananda. Gurumai means uh, one who is completely uh, enraptured in the guru, or Gurumai can also mean like motherly guru type. Uh, okay. So um, Guru Mai had noticed that there were some problems with uh, her brother. In fact, he had some issues with sexuality. It came out that for about six years, he had had sex with five or six different women. When it came out that her brother had violated his vow of celibacy, she orchestrated him being falsely imprisoned in New York. He was beaten up by a number of the women that had accused him of sleeping with him, and then he was kicked out of Siddha Yoga. This shows sort of the dilemma and drama of succession. How do you get from one guru who has died to a next guru? And it's always problematic in these groups. Uh, it should be noted that Swami Chidvalasananda, or Guru Mai, is still the head of Siddha Yoga, though she has very little to do with the daily actions of the movement, and she no longer tours to do intensives or give public speaking and whatnot. But I saw her a, a bunch of times when I was in India one time. Uh, Nityananda Jr., you see depicted up on the right, was harassed for years. He was met by Siddha Yoga people who would protest him everywhere he would speak. Some of them would even violently attack him and his devotees. Now, Guru Mai may or may not have ordered her disciples to do this, but she was witnessed to have tacitly approved of it and nodded knowingly when she heard about these actions. In fact, if you go to any of the city yoga centers, despite uh, Nityananda Jr. being such an important figure for so many years and to be sort of like the co-head of the order for three years, you'll never find a picture of him at any of their locations. Intriguingly, um, years later, Nityananda renewed his vows uh, and he set up a small ash ashram in upstate New York. And he just said, he's like, I was too young for this. Like Guru Mai was like 28 or 29. He was like 19 or something when he took the vows and became like the co-head of the order. Nityananda makes a really interesting point in his interview with Harris. He says that Indians ignore 50% of what a guru says and just do what they need to do in their lives. But Westerners 100% submit to the guru. This is what leads to abuses by gurus and <clears throat> this leads to abuses by gurus and devotees that do troubling things to support the guru. So his point is no Indian completely submits to the guru in the way that Westerners do. And because of the way that Westerners are so unquestioning of the guru and they build the guru up so much, that leads to these types of abuses and gurus you know, getting away with things and, and doing bad things. We'll talk more about gurus doing bad things in just a second.
As such, I ask, what does it mean for Westerners to follow an Indian guru? Does the Indian guru always know that these Westerners will completely submit to their ideals? And do Western gurus or <clears throat> Why, yeah, why do, these West, why do these gurus accept these positions when they know that the Westerners are going to be so much different than Indians? Or is it just that they want that power, want that position? All of this is to say that transnational movements like this one become removed <coughs> from their Indic contacts and these overdevoted devotees <coughs> begin to do the types of things that we see in Western cults. So now I'll turn for the last part of our lecture on to Western cult. He read an article called The Man Who Saves You From Yourself by a man, or it's about a man named <clears throat> Richard Sullivan. Now, there's a novelist who wrote this. This novelist is named Nathaniel Rich, and he describes this cult deprogrammer, someone who can get you out of a cult or get your family member out of a cult. And he was kind of this really tough, really smart, really interesting guy. Unexpectedly, he died just days after this article came out. He he died like like here's a picture of him. He like the article came out, and then like ten days later, he died tragically in young life. But he sounds like a very interesting character. So who is David Sullivan? Well, David Sullivan was raised in Boulder, Colorado, um, and he was in Boulder, Colorado in the 1960s. And Boulder, just north of me here, uh, was a huge spot for new religious movements and Tibetan Buddhism. There's a lot of Tibetan Buddhism out there. It's still that way today. It's kind of like a new age site with also a lot of very strong Buddhist roots. There's a remarkable amount of Tibetan Buddhism in Colorado, I think because of the climate and many uh, Colorado, Colorado towns have Tibetan communities in them, which led to me having a particularly <laughs> interesting laugh one summer as I went to a Tibetan restaurant and proceeded to have a conversation with the grandfather of the whole family who was amazed that I could speak Tibetan. And uh, we, we had a long talk about making dumplings. It was, it was a lovely day. Okay, so he grew up in Boulder, Colorado, and he had sort of an interest in religions his whole life. In fact, he'd experienced a lot of people joining cults in the 1970s, and he had a lot of experiences talking people out of joining cults. So at a young age, he started trying to get people out of these organizations. At one point, a friend of his grandparents actually decided that they wanted to go to French Guiana um, and stay in Jonestown. Now, what is Jonestown? Jonestown was a town set up by Jim Jones down here on the right. Jim's, Jim Jones is a charismatic Christian leader uh, from the 1960s and 70s. And he had the People's Ten Temple in San Francisco, which was a remarkably integrated, like racially integrated sort of charismatic Christian group. And he argued for social justice to its extreme. And he said that the United States would never be able to treat his followers who were the many colors of the rainbows uh, honestly and fairly. So they moved to Jonestown in French Guiana. Jim Jones Temple in Jonestown, in fact, ended up being one of the largest instances of mass suicide in a religious movement. When you hear the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid, it's because Jim Jones, believing that the governments of the world were going to crack down on him, mixed poison with Kool-Aid and had his disciples all drink this Kool-Aid and men, women, and children died. And he killed himself as well. It's really horrible. Anyway, so uh, Sullivan ends up teaming up with a woman named Margaret Singer, who is an important psychologist working on cult movements and brainwashing techniques, not just in the religious context, but within the political uh, context. She may have had some CIA connections. And these two worked together to take down cults throughout both of their lives. They really wanted to help people get out of cults and reintegrate themselves into society. Notably, Sullivan argues that if you could not get a person to be deprogrammed, if you can't get somebody out of the cult, you can't get them to think clearly and leave, then his te technique was to just go crazy and destroy the entire system. These two really felt that if they couldn't get people out, they would destroy the religious movement because these religious movements, these cults are really dangerous and antisocial. So Sullivan would use a number of techniques to deprogram people. He excelled at speaking with cult members 
uh, and really gaining their trust. The way to deprogram them was not to refute their doctrine, but he would show the bad power dynamics in cult membership and with cult leaders. This is often what pushes cult people out of these religious groups and out of cults. He tells a great story about the Divine Light mission in which there was a young boy, uh, a young Indian boy who came to the United States, and he had a friend who completely believed that this young boy was the most glorious uh, incarnation of God, and he went and he watched and he looked like, okay, this is kind of some standard Hindu Godman stuff. But when he really looked, he realized that the boy's mother was always whispering in his ear and telling him what to do and what to say and whatnot. And he tried to refute that this, this kid was not a God. And his friend was like, no, 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 no. And so he finally said, look, you can join that cult, but you won't be serving that, you know, that kid. You'll be serving his mother. And he got her where she lived because this woman had a bad relationship with her own mother. And when he pointed out those power dynamics, it was really the mother that was running it. That was when his friend was like, I'm out of this. So what his big trick to do was not as much to tell people that their religion was wrong. In fact, he would try to speak to them as if their religion was correct. But, you know, say that if they believe all of this, then why is this type of stuff happening? And that was his way that he would get people out. All right, caveat emptor, buyer beware. I am rarely cynical about religions in general, but, but I am often cynical about religious organizations of all types. I have a lot of friends involved in a lot of religious movements. I have a lot of friends that get out of religious movements. Um, one thing that I often tell disillusioned people is that they were naive, in fact, to think a religious group is anything more than just a group of human beings and human beings act human. Have you met humans? Humans are sketchy. So when you find a religious group, remember whether it's a church, whether it's a cult, whether it's a new religious movement, whether it's a Buddhist teacher, remember all these people around you are just human. Human all too human often. Okay, I'm about to be really cynical, cynical in the last part of this lecture. So in a cult, the charisma of a founder pulls people in, but then structures work to institutionalize that charisma. I mean, I always look at L. Ron Hubbard here on the right and I go, why the heck did this guy become so potent? Or you look at Keith Rainier on the right and go, this dude, this is like the sketchiest dude that tries to get me into Amway. Why? Well, these people have a charismatic something but then the organization around them works to make them more and more powerful, to make you believe that they are these realized, powerful, enlightened human beings. So the question I often ask with a religious leader is, are you having a genuine encounter with that religious leader or religious figure, or is it the trappings of it? Is it the group around them? Is it the way they're being depicted by their group that makes one believe that these charismatic leaders are enlightened, divine representatives of God. So membership and performing the practices and lifestyle of the organization becomes more intense than the teachings. What do I mean by that? I mean that the folks that get involved end up, they get involved with the group because they believe in the ideology or the religious sort of theories. But over time, living it with the group and supporting the organization takes up all their time and becomes more intense than anything about the teachings. It becomes more about keeping the cult going than about any personal religious growth. Folks consistently say about these groups that everything starts out really well, but the group shifts from having a personal experience or being about charity, to being all about perpetuating the organizations. Cults are organized around all sorts of stuff. Some of them are organized around doing charity and service to the world. Some around a religious idea. Some about personal growth. So like if you look at Scientology, it's very much about becoming the most perfect version of yourself that you can be, which doesn't really seem overtly religious. Some groups are purely about personal growth without any overt or classical religious symbolism, such as Scientology or Nexium. In the United States today, there are 2 million people in cults. Yeah, there's 2 million people. So that's a fair amount. So people who leave these groups, no matter how benign their ideology is, 
report fearing reprisals. The people that want to leave are afraid they will lose all their friends, they will lose all their families, that they will not have any money, that they will, that that um, the people that remain in the group will continue to work against them, that will, uh, that will, will beat them down and stalk them and, and hurt them. Folks in the groups who stay in the group are implicitly or explicitly uh, encouraged to harass people who leave it. In fact, in Scientology, they'll call someone who's resistant to Scientology a suppressive person. And this term suppressive, we've actually found has leaked out into a sort of other uh, new religious movements and cults. So anyone who's critical is declared a, so anyone who's critical of the cult would be declared a suppressive person. And then anyone who's still in the group is encouraged to never talk to that person again, have no contact with them, or even in some cases, especially in Scientology, to harass folks who've been critical of their religion. Now, when we're examining cults and new religious movements, new religious movements materials, we observe that their ideologies and doctrines are often quite the same. They usually have a couple of, you know, usual pop religious ideas, and they draw from contemporary psychology and human potential ideas, and they dress them up as innovative, but they generally say, say kind of the same things. And their techniques for running their organization, in fact, are identical. Their symbols, their literature, their jargon might differ, but the structure and philosophy are remarkably similar. When studying functional religious organizations, i.e. not cults and scams, their doctrines and systems seem more and more different the more and more you study them. So this is kind of, I think, a key point that I realized when I was looking at a bunch of these groups, is the more I look at different like Hindu groups, the more I see that they're different. But the more and more you sort of look at different cults, like I have a lot of trouble separating out Nexium from Scientology. And I mean, granted, Marshall Applewhite here on the left had a, 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 a somewhat Christian group that was surrounding UFOs. The ideology might have had UFOs in it, but the whole thing was about, you know, a personal quest to transcend oneself into a grander sort of um, cosmic society. That sounds a lot like what Jim Jones was arguing or the founder of the Children of God over here was arguing for. So you can learn to recognize a cult or what I call manipulative antisocial new religious movements. But you got to remember that people that are recruited into a cult, they don't have like the background to recognize sort of these patterns that I'm going to lay out for you. They just see a good thing, compelling leadership, and they want to be involved. Remember, most people aren't religious studies scholars. So when you find a group like, say, Siddha Yoga, and they say they have this really innovative program, people aren't going to know, like, wait a minute, I see you. This is like Kashmir Shaivism. I see what you're doing. This is Tantra, but you're not selling it as Tantra. So y'all being educated as you are in religious studies will have a much better chance of not being recruited by cults. And one of the reasons why I actually teach this, uh, this particular module is it's an intervention to so you can see when sketchy stuff is going on. And so you don't get hoodwinked and get involved with one of these groups as it is. So Margaret Singer actually argued that there are two key aspects to every cult's operation. Cult leaders, and she argues also that cult leaders have the same skill sets as con men, as advertisers, as politicians. I think she also says as used car salesmen. So what are like the two big things that cults do? The first thing is recruits should not know they're being recruited. When someone, when a group of people is trying to get you into this new religious group, you should, you don't realize that you're being or recruited into an organization. <clears throat> you think you're just, you know, going to see a teacher. And the next thing you know, you have start developing these intense relationships with other devotees and they sort of what they call love bombing you. Suddenly you're surrounded with all these really positive people and you're like, oh, everything is good. This is a good thing I'm doing. You don't see that over time, their goal is going to be to get you into their organization and have your main task in life be propagating and supporting that organization, which leads to the second key point, monopolizing recruits time. So once you're a devotee and once you're in, they try to have that religious organization becoming your whole life and dominate every waking hour you have. So Sullivan or Singer and Singer both argue that these uh, cult leaders are never true believers. They never actually believe in their own ideology. Um, and you'll also notice that their ideology matches their own personal desire. So if a devotee is, if all the devotees are pretty women, it's probably because he wants to get laid. If the devotees are always wealthy, 
it is probably because he's trying to get money. So if you look at the guru and they have a sort of excess of wealth and comfort while saying that everyone else should be poor and striving, that's yet another red flag. Okay, now um, Sullivan argues that some people like at the top of the organization will recognize that the whole game is about money and power. Um, but because they're implicated in that system, just as the leader is, they're not going to tell people about this. So if you're a longtime devotee that sees that the whole thing is about money and power, you're a longtime devotee and you're in, in the inner circle. So you're not going to want to tell people this because you're probably financially bound to it. And you're not going to want to say that you threw away your whole life on a scam. Um, the recruitment techniques are really similar. Okay, um, sorry, I don't have good slides on these next ones. Um, the recruitment techniques are really similar. What they do is they try to tear folk down. And when they're trying to like get you into the group, they try to really tear you down and then build you up. So they wanna break you from your usual identity and reform you as a perfect devotee. Sullivan describes a sort of Mormon-esque group that isolates folks for days, restricts their eating and sleeping and humiliates them until they break down. And then they are reborn and they are rebuilt as powerful new individuals that think just like everyone else in the order. Um, similar to, yeah, you know, yeah, so they wanna make the order everything about you. They break you down and then they build you back up by installing the software of the religious organization in your head. Um, there's a very potent tool that you find in a lot of these groups which is humiliation alternating with praise. So the guru will be like really mean to you one minute and then they'll praise you the next. And this keeps you in this off kilter emotional place. This is not dissimilar from army boot camp in which your boot camp drill sergeant just beats you down to nothing until then they can rebuild you as a perfect soldier. Now, Sullivan tells a remarkably interesting story and I don't have any pictures on this about a character named Swami Sebastian. Sullivan tells this story of a Georgia con man who bounces around the country until he ends up in Los Angeles. There he sets himself up as a Tantra guru who is also said to be the second coming of Christ. Yeah, he's just pulling all that together. Now, uh, Sebastian actually leaves town with his prettiest but not his wealthiest uh, devotee after Sullivan locates a, a sort of drug figure from back east who uh, Swami Sebastian had ripped off and he tells this sort of mafioso guy uh, the address of Swami Sebastian. And Swami Sebastian immediately beats feet out of there and disappears. He flees with, the, with all the money he can and with the most pretty and young disciple. When we read about this Swami Sebastian, we see he uses terms like Tantra and a way to justify his con. That's a thing that all of these figures do. They use traditional religious ideology to justify their own system and their own system is going to enrich only them at the detriment to his other dev devotees. Now, Swami Sebastian is not a Hindu, but he uses Hindu terminology often incorrectly, and also pulls from Rastafarian religion. Regardless of what he's pulling from, he didn't do a very good job of it, but he was effective enough to support his lifestyle and have you know, five or six incredibly devoted uh, women that were probably likely as sexual slaves as well. Now, Sullivan is a cult deprogrammer, and these guys are problematic the more you look into them. Often they will kidnap people and then they'll deprogram them over a long period of time once they're in isolation with them. This can be a problem because it can be legal kidnapping. And if it doesn't work, if the deprogrammer doesn't really do it right and the person isn't uh, reformed, then they can go back to the cult and say, look, the world is out to get us. I had this group of people from my family that kidnapped me and tried to convince me that our religious group is evil. So then when they find themselves legitimately persecuted, this emboldens the cult even more. Folks may hire uh, these occult deprogrammers against family members who are actually not in cults at all, but are just rebelling or have left the family ideology. So this happens often if, say, someone is raised a Christian, and then they become a Wiccan, and they're just hanging out with their little witchcraft group. And the next thing you know, the Christian family has gone and said they're in a cult, and they hire a deprogrammer to basically go and harass somebody who just doesn't want to be a part of the religion of their family. Uh, also, you can see folks will use occult deprogrammers to, um, I don't even need to say that, uh, yeah, 
So another thing is one person's cult is another person's religion and family members may manipulate cult deprogrammers just to get control of a person. Remember that the cult characteristics are not about any specific ideology. That the key is control of time, control of speech, control of sleep, control of sexual partners. The leaders are charismatic but aloof. They request large amount of money. They sell access to themselves. They often surround themselves with attendants who are insiders, work as sort of enforcers in the organization. You'll notice that with a lot of these groups, they give easy access to wealthy people and celebrities and the influential. You'll also see that their charitable work that they always talk about never really pans out. You'll see that they spend more money on their image than on their actual programming or their services or their charities. So be careful. Um, cults and entertainment. Cult shows are big, man. I mean, there's like, and I like them. I like these, these TV shows. There's a dramatized uh, TV show about David Koresh. It's on Netflix. Um, David Koresh was in Waco, Texas. And he had a sort of Christian cult that was attacked and burned up by the FBI. You can watch the TV show called The Oath, which is about Nexium and the dreaded Keith Raniere. Uh, I really like Scientology in the Aftermath, which is Leah Remini trying to get people out of Scientology and expose Scientology. Wild Wild Country is about Rajneesh or Osho, who was a college professor who ditched being a professor to become basically a cult leader and have a community in both India and in Oregon. In Oregon, they were found and convicted of poisoning the local population, running guns and committing incredible fraud. And there's always the ever popular Manson family, a proper Christian religious cult from the 1960s. So what about gurus and cults? Are there gurus who are not in cults? Well, I, the Dalai Lama is a pretty good one. I mean, he's the head of a Tibetan Buddhist order. That's, he's a traditional religious figure. Um, it does cost money to get access to teachings, but they're really not that expensive. Uh, that said, within Tibetan Buddhism, there are other religious figures who I would say are more like cult leaders than so. But, but the Dalai Lama, I, I can go with it. You, there are not every religious leader is a cult leader especially not every religious leader who's not a Christian, you know? So don't over apply cults, but always keep your eye on it and realize that this is an aspect of Hinduism because especially in the 1960s, there were so many of these godmen that came to the United States and appealed to Westerners. And it was a big deal for a while. We don't have any in the same way now. Um, that you do have a character named Sadhguru on the internet who I'd say is pretty culty. Deepak Chopra can be a little sketchy, um, but yeah, we don't have them as prominently now, but they're still out there. I know a few of them. I think a few of them are former scholars. All right, I'll catch you next time.